Welcome to We Solve Problems with your host, James D. Bennett II. In each episode, we'll share educational insights to motivate manufacturers to innovate. You can find this show on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on www.innovativesolutions.org. Now here's the host of We Solve Problems, James D. Bennett II. Good morning, and welcome to the We Solve Problems podcast, where we inform about existing technology, the trend of the R&D of that technology, and the financial incentive to help mitigate risk of innovation. I'm James Bennett, your host. Today, we'll be talking about intellectual property with Mr. Will Jakes, patent law agent at Emanus. Mr. Jakes, could you give us a brief summary of your background, please? Ah, interesting question. So uh, let's see, I'm an engineer by training. Uh, went to Howard University, a BS in mechanical engineering, did training at MIT, uh, and then picked up a master's degree uh, uh, along the way, but uh, actually uh, got into the industry uh, through R&D myself. So I worked for the United States Navy as an R&D engineer and found my way uh, to patents some years later. Oh, great. That really uh, helps. Uh, to put today's podcast into context, if you think about it, in today's business world, Innovative discoveries are being made at an astounding rate. This is because of the accelerated access to information resulting in a proliferation of ideas, discoveries, and new uses for technology fueled by innovation. In the United States, the market for intellectual property has developed out of an increased awareness of intellectual property value and innovation management. U.S. companies are now shifting their focus of value from tangible to intangible assets, which are 90% corporate net worth. And this reality has produced the need to understand, value, and monetize intellectual property through transactions. To get the discussion started, I guess the, proverb, the uh, proverbial question is, what is intellectual property? Mr. Jace, could you, could you give us a definition of what intellectual property is? Yeah, simply uh, intellectual property uh, refers to the uh, legal rights uh, that uh, would be granted to an individual or an organization that's involved with creating things or inventing things that come from the mind. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, James, uh, it involves intangible assets, uh, but these uh, intangible assets are protected uh, by law and they give the owners some level of exclusive rights uh, to these uh, creations. Okay, good. That's a pretty good de definition. Uh, now you've been at the game pretty, 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 uh, for a pretty good while, uh, given your your background that you've given us, uh, and you look, you've probably seen a lot of different patents, a lot of different uh, ways things have been patented. Uh, can you tell us, from your vantage point, which ind industries tend to intensely, or uh, intensively, use intellectual property protection? Uh, it probably bears my mentioning, uh, James. Let me just go back to your previous question just a little bit. Uh, so okay. so the, the, the next few questions will be in context. So there are many different types of uh, intellectual property protection. Most people are familiar with patents, uh, but there are also copyrights, uh, trademarks, even trade secrets, you know, those things that you kind of hold uh, close to the vest that you don't uh, allow to become a part of the public domain. Uh, industrial designs, and believe it or not, even geographical indications. So uh, most people understand that champagne comes from a particular region of France, right? But right. only uh, from that region of France would you be able to use the term uh, champagne uh, to describe, quote unquote, that intellectual property. So with that said, let, let, let's talk a little bit about the industries that really tend to uh, rely on intellectual property uh, uh, to a large extent. Now, uh, it's a very good question because I, I, I'm not really sure uh, how I would break down those industries for all types of intellectual property, hence why I mentioned that. But in the case of utility patents, which is where most people tend to spend their time thinking about uh, uh, intellectual property, uh, the sector that has the most activity would be uh, the technology sector. So we're talking about uh, optics, electronics, software. Uh, it, it surpasses all other uh, industries for uh, uh, 
of patent protection. Okay, well, good, good. So, so then I guess it's safe to say then from your vantage point, uh, the trend of patents being granted would be in the electronics classification. Or, or, or is there a specific classification or are there an array of classifications of those uh, different types of patents in the yeah. electronics? Uh, well, not not particularly, uh, but uh, as a broad class, uh, you're right. It is the group that tends to to outperform the others. Uh, we tend to group them as information technology. So we look at uh, computer hardware, uh, we look at software, telecommunications, you know, other types of networking technologies. But you know, despite the fact that uh, the information technology sector leads. You know, there are other industries that really uh, uh, rely a lot on intellectual property or patent protection as well. And so folks are aware of pharmaceuticals and biotechnology. I mean, drug development, pharmaceutical, bio, biotech sectors are very uh, uh, huge, uh, not only in America, but throughout the world. Uh, and then because information technology tends to grab a hold of the headlines, uh, we forget about automotive and transportation. You know, uh, there's a, a plethora of uh, uh, electric vehicles, autonomous driving systems, and these are grabbing uh, headlines in terms of uh, intellectual property protection as well. Uh, and if I were to round that out, I'd probably uh, mention uh, energy uh, sustainability. So we're looking at renewable energy sources. Uh, just last week, I did uh, a little bit of work in battery technology, uh, where used batteries are now uh, coming into the market to be used to power, you know, households, houses, that sort of thing. And uh, of course, last but not least, uh, mechanical uh, and manufacturing technologies. And so people are aware of uh, robotics uh, and obviously 3D printing. Okay, oh, that's a pretty good uh, overview of that. Uh think moving to uh, 3D printing and uh, artificial intelligence, which is beginning to take center stage in practically all dialogue, news, uh, probably a uh, water cooler, you know, at your job. Uh, what, uh, what are some of the spillable effects that could stem from some of the potential disruptive technology? Because I see those as disruptive technology. Uh, artificial intelligence, especially in 3D printing. And I've seen recently where artificial intelligence and 3D printing are going to, they're thinking about merging those two. Uh, so mm -hmm. spillable, spillable effects come from, you know, uh, uh, offshoots of some of these things like uh, maybe say, for instance, when we had the, uh, say the Apple phone or the iPod, then you had, you know, uh, technology that went into the cars off of the iPhone, it took away the regular landline. Uh, uh, you can also put merge the uh, iPhone with the phone. So, so, and then uh, and of course you had uh, R and D that, that took place with that, and uh, it just opened up a lot of different avenues to service those different uh, those different technologies. So, what would be some of the spill spillover effects uh, stemming from some of the potential disruptive technology like artificial intelligence and three D printing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, just as a backdrop, we, we should understand that uh, technologies like our artificial intelligence uh, and 3D printing have been with us for quite some time. I, I think uh, what's happened is the marketplace uh, uh, and the timing is right today. So we tend to see them a lot, but they've, they've been with us uh, for quite some time in the R&D stage and finally getting into the market. Now, you know, it's just my opinion, but I think the spillover uh, that we will see, for instance, in uh, AI uh, technologies uh, would probably come from the fact that we have better training models, you know, it, and I see those uh, training models, uh, I refer to them as kind of deep or instant learning, right? And so, <laughs> You know, yeah, it, it, you know, we might uh, kind of describe it or I describe it uh, like a baby that quickly senses danger right from a hot item, uh, whether that uh, baby touched the hot item or not. Uh, and that sort of learning, you know, is, is intrinsic uh, to humans and, and to the point where we can start to see machines behave and act in the same way. I think that would be a, a spillover effect that we should uh, see coming on board soon uh, and a, a little bit more on on that later. And I'll say something like in the case of uh, uh, 3D printing, 
which again has also been around for quite some time, James. Uh, it's it's about the use of uh, uh, newer materials that afford uh, themselves to to how 3D printing uh, itself works, uh, you know, the map, how we start to form these uh, intricate shapes. Uh, and there's certain materials that will uh, play a large part uh, in helping to uh, accelerate the, the use of this 3D printing technology. I also think that uh, we will start to see you know, combinations of what we uh, generally refer to as 3D printing, but combined with our traditional uh, kind of for, uh, uh, forming technologies. Uh, may, maybe from a market perspective, I also kind of see, you know, the fact that these machines can be somewhat miniaturized, that we'll start to see manufacturing be a little more uh, decentralized, uh, you know, in response to demand, uh, supply chains, short haul, uh, short -haul transportation. Uh, and, and you may even see manufacturing centers in communities or in people's houses, you know, and the upshot is going to be, you know, well, where you touch, you invent. And so we should start to see some activity come from there. Uh, with those things said, I think probably the most disruption uh, may come from what we uh, call the metaverse uh, technologies. Uh, and I'm not an expert in this area, but based on some of the work that I've seen and some of the inventors that have come across my desk, uh, there's uh, this uh, situation I call where the lines of cognition and understanding are kind of being blurred in this technology space. And so we're starting to understand uh, things uh, uh, in a different way. And it may introduce, uh, for instance, in, in one class, you know, psychotherapies, you know, uh, that don't rely on drugs uh, in, in order to provide uh, mental health care. So uh, that's kind of where I see, you know, 3D and AI kind of taking us in the, in the not too distant future. So in other words, then we could potentially begin to see inventions, maybe some say incremental improvements on AI, 3D printing. Is, is, is that kind of what you're saying there or, or is this going to take somewhat of a, a different spin? I don't know. You know, you know, I, I guess if we if we knew that, James, you and I, we, we, we'd be rich men. I mean, we're always trying to uh, get a sense of uh, forecasting. You know, we do a lot of green space studies, a lot of white space studies, uh, I, you know, but like everything else, I think AI uh, will start to spill over into uh, quote unquote other technology sectors. And so uh, the people that work in those uh, technology uh, sectors will will start to incorporate it in their own inventions and how they uh, see yes. their industries or their their, their products uh, moving yes. ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I can see that happening. I can see yes. that. Yeah. Um, one thing that I've noticed in, in just uh, dealing with sp uh, specific clients, uh, they would come up with an idea. And of course, you know, uh, an idea is, is no good unless it is commercialized and, and, and really uh, bought in bought into say maybe a prototype or a, a working model of it. Mm -hmm. it helps to understand the, the invention and how it works agreed, agreed. Um, but a lot of inventors have good ideas but then they it stops because of the lack of funding mm -hmm. and i want to talk some about uh how you can leverage the r d to take advantage of, the, of those opportunities because there there is uh uh, uh I guess incentive, you know, financial incentive to mm -hmm. to uh, support or to to incentivize the inventor to continue with the invention, even though there may be low funding there. Um, so, can can you speak to that a, a bit? Just just a little. I think, gosh, we've been uh, you know kicking this thing around for the last 100 to 200 years right uh you know ever since we left the guilds uh, of, uh, of of europe where people uh, kind of held this knowledge very tightly to themselves but i guess you know traditionally the question has always been about how to how to finance r d and uh you know as an industry you and i both know we've tried many different models uh you know for instance things like open innovation and partnering uh with your your customer 
customer base itself in order to really reduce the cost you know associated with uh you know with r d uh itself i mean in my opinion uh, we still need to figure out how to fairly engage uh, the larger populace uh, uh, in our R&D practices. Uh, but again, you know, understanding or the caveat uh, that a lot of what we do in R&D does require pretty sophisticated uh, equipment uh, and resources, you know, that the general public uh, wouldn't have, but uh, there's still a lot of folks out there who we don't traditionally see as R&D people, uh, but uh, they can help contribute to to the research and development process, and in doing so, you know, reduce the cost associated uh, with the, at least identifying where we should put more of our resources into developing new products and services. I see. Uh, one of the things that my firm does is uh, we, I'm a practitioner, research and development tax credit practitioner. And this particular uh, law was enacted back in 1981 during the Reagan administration where uh, people who develop different products and processes, mm -hmm. uh, they can use this particular credit and get back up to 20% of the money that they put into it. I, and I was hoping that maybe we could bring this out to some of the uh, listeners out there to uh, to incentivize them to continue with the R&D, take the plunge, take the risk, and uh, continue to uh, develop the technology because the incentive is there. Uh, it's, it's been, again, it's been here since 1981, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, made, it's been made more taxpayer friendly. In the, in the beginning, it was pretty, pretty difficult, uh, pretty complicated, but now it's been simplified a lot more by the uh, federal government, and uh, that incentive is there for the inventor. Uh, speaking of intellectual property and patents more specifically, uh, part of that Section 41 credit uh, has to do with safe, safe, harbor, safe harbor of patents. In other words, if you have a patent, uh, you have automatically fulfilled three out of the four elements of the qualifying four-part test. Okay. And, uh, in doing so, uh, uh, that will qualify you to put those dollars back into uh, I will realize some some relief on the money that you have put into the development of that prototype or working model. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I think it would be good to put that out there. Uh, and also, there are, there are also uh, research and experimentation uh, uh, expenses that can be applied uh, to the uh, to the uh, uh, invention as well. It would so, certainly go a long way to uh, continuing or at least uh, giving people an incentive, right, to invest the money yes. in R&D. Yeah. Yes, and, and that, was the in, that was the whole intent in the beginning is to mm -hmm. incentivize it, to keep jobs in the United States uh, to, and, and if you develop things and if you take the risk, then that will advance technology as well as maintain jobs in this country, create jobs in this country. And that's what I was getting, getting back to with the spillover effects. Mm -hmm. is, once you have an idea, it, it leads into different directions that you can take, and it, it and, and that way you need the skill worker to come in and and, and uh, man the uh, man the stations, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. to develop the technology. So there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. Are a lot of a lot of companies are beginning to wake up to the idea and take advantage uh, of, of the opportunity. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, James. Uh, you know, it, when I started my practice, it was actually uh, supposed to be an intellectual property uh, news and education service, right? Because uh, I saw something happening. Uh, hence, the, even the name of the firm, uh, Emanis itself, uh, which uh, pretty much kind of means hand, right? Uh, and so my theory was, you know, uh, uh, these kind of laws are, are, are very helpful uh, uh, for America and, and we should try to push them, uh, these incentives as much as possible. And I say that because of this, you know, what you touch, you invent. Uh, and uh, and it's, a, it's a broad way of probably describing uh, manufacturing. But when you take uh, that uh, item or you take uh, that product and you take it outside of the United States, the people who are actually doing the manufacturing is where the ideas uh, come from. Uh, this is where, you know, one gets the quote unquote eureka moment, right? Uh, how to do things better. You, 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 you come to these things because you're actively involved with touching them. 
Uh, and to the extent it's not being touched in this country, I fear uh, that a lot of uh, uh, the IP that tends to, you know, even improvements, you know, uh, in the way we do things, you know, starts to leave the country uh, versus stay in the country simply because the manufacturing uh, isn't necessarily here. Now, I, you know, tongue, you know, with uh, some reservation, there are technologies, biotechnology, certainly in the electronic software space, uh, we tend to do a very good job. Uh, but, you know, we do see these manufacturing and material technologies kind of leaving the country, and that kind of disturbs me a little. Yeah, well, hopefully uh, things can be resolved in Congress with this, and uh, we can continue to uh, have this particular uh, incentive to uh, continue for innovation here in the United States. That's and one thing I, want, I would like to say about this, this, this particular statute as well is that it does not need to go beyond the common knowledge known in the industry at the time that is you don't have to discover something discover something that has not been discovered before like a patent uh, however a patent just like i said is a safe harbor um uh, and um uh, uh, any of the other r d that you have there that that qualifies through the uh qualifying test uh, those costs associated with the uh, particular uh invention or r d project can uh, uh, benefit from the uh, dollar spent. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a bit about monetization at this point. Okay. Uh, can you tell me what? Uh, can you tell us what IP licensing is? And in your estimation, estimation, what is the market size of the IP licensing industry? Well, you know, uh, in terms of monetization, there are many ways to to, to monetize uh, your intellectual property. Certainly, one is by practicing it uh, yourself, and then using. Uh, your uh, intellectual property uh, assets or protection assets uh, to essentially keep others from competing with you, right? That's what uh, patents are. What most uh, uh, that's what intellectual property is. It's uh, it's a right uh, that you have that doesn't necessarily give you the right to do something. It gives you the right to restrict others uh, uh, from copying. And so, uh, to the extent you use it for your own business. Or if you, you understand that uh, if you're not going to manufacture, you're not going to implement in the marketplace, then that same right can be transferred uh, uh, to others. Uh, and that's uh, what we call licensing. Now, uh, try to put a number. Uh, this, it comes to me uh, at least three or four times a year, you know, so what is the market uh, for IP licensing? Well, IP, as I said, you know, involves copyright, trademarks, designs, you know, something as simple as uh, uh, the design of a new Nike sneaker. All of these things, you know, are, are, are some form of intellectual property. Uh, but, you know, uh, IBIS, you know, kind of estimated that uh, at least in 2022, that the market for IP licensing was about 66 billion. And honestly, I kind of think that that number is a little bit low, but it's the best that I can uh, do in terms of giving you an answer on that, James. I love that. Yeah. Well, tell me then, what is a good patent? In other words, what can a potential inventor do to better position invention? to improve the invention's marketing position and possibly the likelihood of attracting a potential licensee or a signing deal. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so let me, I'm gonna take, uh, and I'm gonna take that horse and I'm gonna put it behind the cart uh, just, okay. for, just, just for a second, because a lot of the inventors that come to me, they, they, they actually have some idea of what it is they wanna do, but they come to me and they wanna patent. Uh, and from the perspective of patenting, I always urge uh, my inventors uh, to, to bear in mind or to keep in mind uh, that the patent is not the business. Uh, the business and its product or service and the approach for how you plan to monetize that uh, invention should be uh, their first focus. You know, uh, and then, you know, alongside of that, just understand that the patent really provides some exclusive rights to that invention and it, it, it reduces competition. So if there's $100 in the market and you're able to enjoy all of that competition by keeping others from copying, you know, a, a patent or an invention that you have, then all the good, but at least make sure that you're able uh, to sell something. 
Now, now that said, so what, what's a good patent? Uh, in, in my opinion, it's one that provides uh, claims, uh, uh, and, and let's kind of call that the quote unquote protected features, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's something that is desirable and valuable to the marketplace. Otherwise, it's wallpaper. You know, why, why go through the exercise, you know, of obtaining a patent and the cost of uh, obtaining patents uh, if it's something that, you know, ultimately doesn't uh, result in, uh, in a product or a service that the marketplace wants? Uh, you know, many inventors, I think they should understand uh, that they ought to first uh, try to demonstrate that value. Uh, before, you know, looking at potential licensees or even, you know, monetizing, or I should say capitalizing, you know, uh, on that invention in order to go to the market. They, they really should kind of take a look at the market, uh, maybe concurrently, uh, if, if a budget allows, uh, before uh, they spend too much money uh, in the patent uh, itself. All right, great. And I, I, I do the same thing with some, some of my inventors where, Mm -hmm. At the outset, I do ask, what do you want this patent to do? What, I mean, do you want it for vanity reasons? Do you want a license? Mm -hmm. or do you want to assign it? And then that that dictates the the nature of how the claims would be written and how the uh, uh, patent will be crafted and drafted. The patent application will be crafted and drafted. So but those Absolutely. are things to keep in, keep in mind. Because you see on, on a Shark Tank, sometimes uh, people will uh, come up with inventions and it's just not a good idea. It's just not marketable for some reason or another. But uh, I also let them know that the simpler the patent, the more likely you, you may be able to get a patent on it because there are Absolutely. parts. Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. And uh, that way uh, you probably get it through the examination pro process quicker and have mm -hmm. a better chance of maybe even marketing the thing because people like to buy something that they can understand mm -hmm. and, 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 and that it has high use, high utility. Mm -hmm. Now, good. So a lot of times uh, I've seen uh, some inventors and in, individual inventors uh, have numerous patents. So if, a, mm -hmm. if an inventor has numerous patents, what is the best way to manage those inventions? Hmm. Numerous patents, how to manage them? Well, you know, uh, so I, I spent some time in my career with a company called CPA Global, arguably at the time, uh, mm -hmm. the largest patent management firm uh, in the world. Uh, and so, you know, huge corporations uh, uh, go uh, went to CPA Global, of which I was a part of that organization. And, you you know, if you have these huge portfolios, you're paying maintenance fees. You're, you're, you have to maintain uh, these patents uh, in order to just, just keep them on the books. And hopefully you're keeping them on the books because you do uh, see some potential opportunity down the road, or maybe it's a defensive measure. Uh, but in, in the end of the day, it's all about uh, trying to manage the budget uh, for, from my perspective. So when it's time to let uh, something go, uh, then you don't pay that cost. You, you kind of let that go and you focus on, on that part of your portfolio that you can actually monetize. Uh, most people don't do that audit. Uh, and I, I actually, uh, well, most of my inventors uh, typically don't have huge uh, portfolios, uh, but uh, sometimes what they have are uh, non-contiguous portfolios. So they're inventing something in one area, inventing right. something in another area. Right. Uh, and so you have to put the hard question in front of them uh, that, you know, you're paying for these patents, but where is the organization going and where are your resources going? in terms of getting something uh, uh, saleable uh, into the market. And usually, once you can see that on paper, the decision about whether or not uh, to hold on uh, to some of these patents is very clear. Now, that's not to suggest that you just kind of throw them away. Uh, the other part of, of that study is to sit down with your inventors and actually look for places where others may be able to take advantage, right, of that IP. Uh, and so, you know, there are ways to kind of identify people who might have those interests, you know, and either, as you said earlier, uh, James, you can assign it to them, you know, basically sell that patent uh, to them, or you may find a situation where you're able uh, to license and monetize. And so that drops right to your bottom line, that revenue, uh, right? Uh, and then you can focus on the things that you're doing in your business, uh, you know, the, the 
for for product or service sales. I see. Okay, well, one of the things that I look at from that is just to put it in just in uh, simple terms, I guess it would be a port portfolio. That this is what I talk to my inventors about, mm -hmm. and and you try to rank those uh, uh, based on the strength of it, uh, marketability, uh, mm -hmm. utility, that type of thing from the best. Your, your top tier, mid, mid tier, and, and your bottom tier, and mm -hmm. just try to find out the best ways to uh, uh, who, who who would be in the market uh, for those particular uh, ideas and, and patents. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you tell us just real quick what would an ideal licensing or assignment deal look like? Can you characterize an ideal licensing or assignment deal? <laughs> well, James, you know that's a very loaded question. I'm just, I'm just asking for a simple. <laughs> I'll, okay, I'll, I'll give you my simple because we understand okay. that when, when we start to look at uh, a licensing, uh, uh, particularly the agreements, uh, you know, they could be is sim simply uh, eight pages long to something that you know uh -huh. can run, you know, to to multi tens of pages. Uh, uh, but uh -huh. what the, the thing that I tend to look for in any contractual agreement, not just licensing agreements, but I look uh, uh, clear terms, you know, simple language, uh, and and make sure that those agreements uh, that you have. Uh, identify targets and milestones that uh, that the parties actually agree on in their negotiations. So, you know, to me, it's important to have that transparency uh, uh, within within this partnership because when you're doing this, this is it's now uh, a partnership. Uh, you know, it kind of and the reason I stick to that one is another thing. You know, uh, the late uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell. Uh, used to say, and I'll, I'll sum it up uh, as this, he, you know, he would say, you know, make sure uh, that there are provisions that make it just as clear and easy on how you're going to get out of the contract as it was for you to get into the contract. Now, what he was talking about was, you know, if you're going to go to war, make sure you understand how you're going to get out. But I think it's, a, you know, it's a, a analogous uh, to what he's saying. Make sure that, you know, that the provisions are clear about how you get out of things, because inver invariably, sometimes partnerships do go south uh, and you need to unwind. Uh, one final question, and you can give a quick answer to this one as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the challenges from your vantage point do businesses face in intellectual property protection in today's uh, business environment? And which ones excite you the most and which ones concern you the most? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, again, my, my market focus is really uh, mostly uh, individuals, uh, uh, what we call uh, independents. And, and, and these may be people who've worked in industries for 20, 30 years. Uh, uh, they have what Malcolm Gladwell calls the 10,000 hours, right? They, they actually know uh, what they're talking about. And then some smaller uh, companies. But what I try to focus on and I find challenging is that for these independents and smaller size enterprises, it's all about uh, the budgets for IP. So again, uh, when they come to me and they have an idea and they want to, to have some kind of intellectual property protection, I try to look at the full gamut. I don't just look at the patenting. Uh, there might be an approach uh, in terms of getting into the market and generating uh, revenue uh, by looking at, say, trademarking, uh, you know, or designs uh, per se, and maybe not as strong as utility patents, but still, you know, when you're working with smaller budgets, it may give you enough, you know, uh, to sustain some level of competitive uh, uh, exclusivity in, in terms of getting uh, uh, that product into market. So to sum it up, you know, I sit down and I think the challenge is to look at the budgets first and then allocate, you know, uh, reasonably across the different types of IP protection uh, uh, and then make a call as to which one of those has the greater chance of surviving in the marketplace and generating revenue for the individual or the small firm. Okay. With that, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Mr. Jakes, for your time today and your uh, valuable insets, insights. Uh, could you tell us where we can find you for future reference? 
Well, right now, a <laughs> very good question. You talk about intellectual property, but my website is www.emanis.com, uh, which I will, uh, you know, say is down for uh, repair. But you can also find a few of my insights on LinkedIn uh, under uh, Will Jakes, that's W I L. Uh, last name spelled J-A-C-Q-U-E-S. And uh, within the next month, you should see my website back up and running. Uh, and then I always invite people uh, to uh, 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 give me a phone call right now. I'm still uh, pretty high touch with most of my clients. So uh, there are many ways for them to reach me. Thanks, James. Oh, great. Thank you for uh, being our guest today. Again, I'm James Bennett. I can be found at www.innovativesolutions.org. That's innovative, one, one N, no E, innovativesolutions.org. Thank you guys for your time today and your attention, and we'll see you on the next podcast. You've been tuning into We Solve Problems with your host, James D. Bennett II. Learn more about financial incentives to mitigate the risk to better your products at www.innovativesolutions.org, where you can find other episodes of this show. Thank you for your positive feedback, comments, questions, and for sharing this with others.